Howdy, y'all. I'm Dr. Jeff Jarvis, and I want to do a quick video on how to improve our care of patients having STEMIs, ST segment elevation myocardial infarctions. Now, there are, the way I see it, six key things that we have to do in order to take care of these patients. Number one, we have to suspect them. Number two, we have to diagnose them. Number three, and the order is important here, we have to notify the hospital that this is a STEMI. Number four is treatment and transport. Number five is document this correctly so that number six, you can get credit for the great work that you're doing. So let's take a look at some of these concepts. That order, as I said, is really important. I want you to notify the hospital. Think of that hospital notification as part of your important treatment. So let's talk about who to suspect a STEMI in. Now, we have all gone through a lot of training about silent MIs, and that's great. We should increase our index of suspicion for patients who might be having atypical presentations. We need to keep an open mind about it, but not so open that our brain falls out. Most patients having STEMI have chest pain. Even women in diabetics, those patients that we have had drilled into our heads, have silent MIs. It's true, they are more likely to have silent MIs or atypical presentations than men, say, or non-diabetics. But even in that group, they're more likely to have chest discomfort than not. Now, they may not, any of these patients, may not say they're having chest pain as their primary complaint. They may describe it as a heaviness or a tightness or a pressure or a squeezing. And as a matter of fact, if they describe it like that, it's actually more likely to be from their heart than if they describe it as a poking sensation. So the description is important, and sometimes you actually have to pull it from the patient. This is why I don't ask if they're having pain. I ask if they're having any type of discomfort. So if I'm worried this may be an MI, for example, I look at a 12 lead and it's looking pretty squirrely, I really want to go back and see if there's anything that they might be feeling and just describing it in a bizarre way. The other thing that is important here is how long the symptoms have been going on. They may say five days. It's important to determine whether that is five days of continuous symptoms or five days of symptoms off and on. If it is five days of continuous symptoms, it's unlikely or less likely to be a heart attack. On the other hand, people will say, well, I've been having it for five days, and you say, well, continuous or off and on? Oh, no, it's off and on. And then you ask them, well, how often are you having these symptoms during the day? Well, I'll have them maybe once or twice during the day. Okay, great. When you have these symptoms, how long do they last? Well, they last 30 or 40 minutes. Now what you know is that the symptoms are really lasting around 30 or 40 minutes, not five days. Now, if they tell you they're having sharp poking chest pain that lasts only a few seconds, that is highly unlikely to be from their heart. So pain lasting only a few seconds, unlikely to be from the heart, especially if it's localized. Like, I feel like I'm being poked right here. Not here, not here, here. Only that place, only a few seconds, probably not ischemic. So... If you suspect a patient is having a STEMI, get a 12-lead ECG. That 12-lead is really important. Now, from a diagnosis standpoint, we spend a lot of time in school trying to learn how to interpret an ECG, and I think that's great. It's really important. But we lose sight of the fact that a STEMI has two parts, not just one. It's not just the ECG. It is an ECG with positive findings, so ST segment elevation, two or more continuous leads, and 
an appropriate clinical context. So it's the STEMI and the story. Hopefully that is making sense. If you see a STEMI on ECG, particularly one where you're not really confident, maybe you have to squint your eyes, maybe you have to think really hard, but you see something that might be elevation, maybe the machine's not calling it, but you're a little nervous, and the patient just is not having anything chest pain-ish. Maybe it's an ankle injury. That is probably not a STEMI. As a matter of fact, highly, highly unlikely to be a STEMI. There's nothing 100% in the world of medicine, nothing 100% in life, but that is very unlikely. They've done studies, you know, 60% of the time it works every time. That doesn't make sense. If you miss that STEMI, that's all right. I probably would have missed it. Most cardiologists probably would have missed it. The other end of that is you have a 12 lead that clearly has ST elevation and the patient has no symptoms. You have asked, you've, are you sure it's not just a discomfort? Yes, I'm not having any symptoms. Let's say they went to a clinic for um, just a normal physical and got a 12 lead in the machine red STEMI. Patient has no symptoms. That is also highly unlikely to be a STEMI. If you really feel worried about it, call OLMC. We can consult or just let the ER doc know. It says STEMI. I don't think it is. The patient's not having any symptoms and let them decide what to do. All right, so from a diagnosis standpoint, appropriate clinical context plus the ECG. All right, that is how you diagnose it. Let's talk about treatment now. And we all know aspirin is an important treatment, and that is true. You have to treat 47, 42 or 47 patients with aspirin who are having a STEMI to save one additional life. That's actually pretty good. That's a number needed to treat of 42 to 47, pretty good, but it is not time critical. As long as we get the aspirin in before we get to the hospital, we've done our job, patient will do well. They will get the benefit. The time critical intervention is notifying the hospital so that they can get the wheels in motion to get that cath lab ready to go as soon as the patient gets there. We know from the literature that EMS pre-notification reduces the time to uh, percutaneous coronary intervention, PCI, so the cath lab, and that saves lives. It improves mortality. That's good. So when you have identified the patient as having a STEMI, don't wait until you get to the ambulance to do the notification. Don't wait until you've gotten your IV, gotten this additional vital signs, given the patient aspirin. All of that can wait. Do the notification immediately. doesn't take very long. And you have a partner. You can be working on doing the other things at the same time. All right. So suspect, diagnose, treat, notify. Remember, notify is part of the treatment do that from the bedside. Do it as soon as possible. Now, let's talk about that documentation and getting the credit. There are three measures that we look at to see how well we're taking care of patients with STEMIs. One is the proportion of STEMIs that we give aspirin to. Really easy. What we have to do there is give the aspirin. And then we need to document that we did it. So what if the patient has a deathly allergy to aspirin. Well, I still want you to document the aspirin as a procedure just as though you had given it. You enter it into the medication just like you normally do, and there's a little minus button up there. If you click on that, a box will open up and give you reasons why you didn't give the aspirin. That's how you get credit for it easy to do. Don't put it in your narrative or feel free to put it in your narrative as long as you do this too. That's how our measures pick it up. So patients having a STEMI, give them the aspirin, document it as a medication procedure. If you didn't give it for whatever reason, still put that in there, click the negative and give the reason. Now we have another measure that looks at the time to first 12 lead. The American Heart Association's Mission Lifeline has a goal of getting 
at least 75% of patients with STEMIs getting their first 12 lead within 10 minutes. We are not hitting that in this system. So how do we do it? Well, number one, we get the 12 lead before the ambulance ever gets there. That's why a 12 lead ECG is a BLS skill. So if you're an EMT on an engine, you get there, make contact, you're worried the patient is having a STEMI. They're having chest pain. They're having upper abdominal pain. Whatever it is, you're worried about it. Get that 12 lead immediately. It is a BLS skill. As soon as the medic unit gets there, hand them your 12 lead. Say, I'm worried this is a STEMI. Give them the 12 lead. If you are the medic coming in on the transport unit, when you're doing your documentation, document that 12 lead that the BLS crew did. So let's talk about how to document that 12 lead that the BLS engine did in a way that makes sure that you're getting credit for it. So first in image trend, go to patient care, go down to treatment, and you'll see something that says cardiac monitor medical care device, click add. Your next screen will pop up and you'll have a question on there about medical device administered prior to EMS care. If your uh, engine did that, just go ahead and say yes, it was prior to arrival, but document the time up under the date time of event, document the time from the 12 lead. That will make sure we get that time down and can get credit for it. Remember, it has to be done within 10 minutes of patient contact. All right, under medical device event type, choose 12 lead ECG. Under medical device ECG lead, this is a multi-select, select all of the leads that had elevation in them. Under provider rhythm interpretation, this is actually the rhythm, sinus rhythm, junctional rhythm, atrial fibrillation, whatever it is. This is not where there's a STEMI. Under provider ECG interpretation, this is also a multi-select, but this is where you want to click what type of STEMI that you saw. You can write in any comments if you want. Now, to manually to enter that 12 lead, what you want to do is do a scan of it and just click on the ECG waveforms, hit add, and take a photo. And then just take pictures and it will be entered in there. Go ahead and make sure you hit keep. You can repeat this as many ECGs as you want. Now, if your monitor, that first 12 lead was on your monitor, you're the transport medic, obviously you can import that from the Zoll Cloud. You do that in the normal fashion. You hit the ECG button indicated here. Then you select a Zoll Cloud or uh, Philips Cloud if that may be the case. You'll see, put in your date range. You'll see all the available ECGs. Click the one you want and click download. That'll pull it down from the cloud and you'll see what got pulled down, all of the things that came down. Now, this is going to pull in all events, so maybe there is, I don't know, a defibrillation or something. Just click the Xbox if you want to get rid of the events that were not 12 lead ECGs. It'll ask if you are really sure. And then you document it from there on just like you normally would. If a uh, someone other than you on the transport unit did the 12 lead, just select crew member and firefighter first responder as an example. And then the rest of the documentation is the same. Now going back to those measures, the aspirin one is easy. If the patient was having a STEMI, aspirin needs to be listed, whether it was given or whether it wasn't. If it wasn't, just list Y. Next, to, and remember, list Y in that procedure. The time to first 12 lead, that's pretty self-explanatory. The time to hospital notification, this one can be a bit tricky because the heart association's measure is 10 minutes from first positive 12 lead not first 12 lead. You might have done five 12 leads before you got a positive one. You have 10 minutes from the first positive one. How do we measure that? Well, we look for the first ECG that has STEMI diagnosed the way we talked about doing it. All right, so that is how we, how we not only take care of our STEMI patients, 
how we document it, and how we get credit for it. Guys, I hope this has been helpful. As always, if you have any questions, please give us a call up at OMD. Thank you for what you do every day. Y'all have a great day.